The Bible predicts Satan will reveal himself to humanity just before Jesus Christ returns. Is that deception nearer than we think? Keep watching. He is waiting for an event that will fission human history, splitting the immediate past from the oncoming future. We find that their expectation of the cosmic Christ is tied in with sun worship. It is almost impossible to find in the history of the world a form of idolatry that is not connected with sun worship. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. But the religious leaders of the day influenced and pushed them and coerced them into asking for Barabbas. So don't miss what the Pope is asking for. He is saying, here is how we solve the climate crisis. Here is how we move forward as humanity. So how do you come out of Babylon and become part of God's kingdom? It's very simple. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Second Corinthians 11 verse 14 says that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. In this video, we're going to look at prophecy, we're going to look at history, we're going to look at current events happening in the world right now and ask a simple question. Could this revelation or appearing of Satan actually be much closer than we think? Let's dive right in. In Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The name Lucifer means light bearer. This was the name of the mighty angel in heaven that fell away from God and rebelled against God in heaven. This passage tells us why Lucifer rebelled. It says, You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So we see that Satan in heaven, before he was Satan, was a strong, mighty angel named Lucifer. He had a position of high responsibility in the government of God. But one day, he began to want the worship and the power and the honor that alone is due to God, and he wanted to be like God. The Bible tells us what happened next. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, we read, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So the devil lost this battle in heaven. He was not allowed to stay anymore, and the Bible tells us what happened after Satan lost this battle in heaven. Verse 9 in Revelation 12 goes on, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him." Now Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples one day, explained to them that he had actually seen the devil or Satan falling from heaven at the end of this war. Here's what Jesus said, Luke 10 verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now this makes sense, doesn't it? Lucifer, who was Satan's name before he became Satan, means light bearer. Not that he himself was the light. God is light. Jesus is light. The Bible is light. Lucifer was only a light bearer because he was a reflector of light. The Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, that Lucifer's job in heaven before he rebelled was to stand next to the throne of God. And as he stood next to the throne of God, he reflected the light that came from God. Lucifer's problem was that one day he became proud and thought that the light was his, and he forgot that he was merely reflecting the light of God. And so this is why Jesus tells his disciples that I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. This was a beautiful, glorious angel until sin destroyed him. Now, when Satan and his angels that followed him were kicked out of heaven, they were not allowed to manifest themselves as angels here on earth. The book of Jude tells us in Jude verse 6, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, 
So according to the Bible, Satan and the demons which were cast out of heaven with him are trapped here on earth. They are not allowed to leave. And furthermore, they are not allowed to reveal or manifest themselves to human beings. Rather than revealing themselves as angels of light or with any kind of brightness or glory, they are, according to the Bible, trapped in chains of darkness. Now, Satan had a problem because he wanted worship and he wanted uh, humanity to serve him and to honor him, and yet he couldn't reveal himself to humanity. So how could he direct people away from God toward himself? Satan looked at the creation that God had made and he picked the brightest thing that is visible to human beings. That is the sun. Remember, Lucifer's name means light bearer, and he picked the brightest thing in God's creation, which is the sun, and then he tried to make that represent himself. Here's what the historians say about sun worship. Sun worship was the earliest idolatry. And again, it makes sense. Lucifer picked this brightest object in the sky to represent himself, and so sun worship has been the earliest form of idolatry. Another historian says it this way, It is almost impossible to find in the history of the world a form of idolatry that is not connected with sun worship. And in almost every nation, sun worship has been the principal worship, so that it may fairly be described as the universal worship. Let's see if that is true or not. We'll take a quick tour of the world and look at some of the uh, religions around the world throughout history and see if we find sun worship as a basis of those religions. We'll start with ancient Greece. The Greek god Apollos was represented as a sun god. You can see that the rays of light are beaming out from around his face. And if you look closely at the enlarged inset picture there, you can see that some of those rays are straight and some are wavy. This is a common theme that we find, the straight and wavy um, representation of the sun god. There's a connection there with these uh, male and feminine uh, aspects of pagan worship as well. When we go to ancient Egypt, we see that Isis, again, was a representation of the sun god. There is the solar disk above the head of Isis. We can go to pagan Rome, ancient Rome, and the god Helios, also again represented with these rays of light shining out from around his head. On the right side, you can see another representation, an engraving of Helios. Here he is riding four horses, and again, you see the rays of the sun spreading out from around him. Now, just as a point of interest, you might recognize this headgear from the Statue of Liberty in the United States. And it brings to mind the question, what is the power that is truly behind this nation uh, of liberty and freedom? That's a good question to ask. Let's keep going. In uh, South America, in the Inca culture, we see the god Inti. And once again, here is half of a solar disk, the round circle. And you'll notice again very clearly that there are wavy lines and straight lines. Again, this combination of male and female that is part of sun worship. If we go to Asia, we can look at Japan and in the Shinto religion, once again, there are the sun disks behind uh, one of the uh, divine beings represented there on the right side. Again, with Japan, we have Jainism, and it doesn't seem to matter what religion we're looking at or where in the world we are looking. There are always these round solar disks behind the heads of their divine beings. Again, in Japan, this was a goddess named Amaterasu, which literally means shining in heaven. And you can see very clearly the rays shining out from behind this divine being. And we are reminded of Lucifer's name, which was Lucifer, which means a light bearer. Let's keep going. We can go to China and we can look at Buddha and the different representations of Buddha. Uh, very, very often we see that solar disk behind him. So on the left side of the screen, you can see very faded on the wall behind this statue. There are three uh, beings connected with Buddhism here, and uh, they all have the solar disk. You can see it more clearly on the right side. Here is a statue of Buddha, and even more obvious is the solar disk behind him 
And then on the right side, a final one, an engraving here. Uh, Buddha always has the solar disk behind him. And we are seeing, again, wherever we go, no matter the religion, the sun worship aspect has worked its way into all of them. Now, as long as we are looking at uh, China, here is the Chinese dragon, very large sculpture. And here is the dragon carrying a sun on its back. And uh, perhaps you remember the verse we read a few minutes ago, Revelation 12, verse 7, which describes the devil or Satan as a dragon. And here we have the dragon carrying the sun. Well, let's look at a few more. We can go to Hinduism. We find the exact same thing. Here is the uh, god or goddess Krishna. And um, again, the solar disk behind. You can see the wavy lines here. They look like flower petals or leaves, perhaps. On the right side, once again, very clear solar disk, sun worship, obviously a part of this system as well. Even the occult world, which maybe we don't have the figurines or the statues and so forth, but even in the occult and spiritualism world, we find that their expectation of the cosmic Christ is tied in with sun worship. Here's what Violet Tweedale, who was a Scottish author and poet and also connected with the spiritualism movement about a hundred years ago, she said this, Hammurabi, in the introduction to his laws, states that he received them directly from the great sun god, who to us is the cosmic Christ. So it doesn't matter what religion we look at, it doesn't matter what time period we look at, uh, even those that, you know, would be in a very different type of religion, or the occultism or spiritualism, we are finding the sun god is at the root of all of them. Now, what does God, how does God feel about sun worship? He was very clear about that in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel. In this passage that we're about to look at, Ezekiel receives a vision and he sees things taking place in the temple at Jerusalem that should not be taking place there. And God shows him one thing after another, and each thing gets more and more serious and severe until God shows him the very final thing. This is the last straw, so to speak, the greatest abomination. What is it? Here we're reading from Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 15. Then he said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Now God had been very specific when he told Moses and the Israelites how to construct the wilderness sanctuary. The temples in Jerusalem were later based on that wilderness sanctuary. And God had given them very clear instructions that when they set up that sanctuary or when they built the temples later on, they were always to be oriented in such a way that when the priests or the people were approaching the temple or going into it, they would always be facing west. And there were two very important reasons for that. One is because in the middle of the sanctuary or the tabernacle was the most holy place. In the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and this is where God's divine presence, His light, was revealed and manifested. In the box underneath the Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the Ten Commandments, written with God's own finger and received by Moses on Mount Sinai. And so God very clearly wanted the people to always be facing toward Him and toward His law as they were worshiping. The second reason is that God wanted their backs toward the east where the sun rose, because He knew that if they were facing east, they would be tempted to worship the sun, just like all of the pagan religions and cultures around them. And in Ezekiel's vision, he saw that that exact thing was taking place in the temple in Jerusalem, that uh, the people that were professing to serve God were actually involved in sun worship. Sun worship had worked its way even into the religion of ancient Israel. And this was one of the big reasons that God allowed the ten northern tribes and then later the two southern tribes of Judah to be taken captive by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Ezekiel received this vision as a captive in Babylon, but God showed him what had been taking place and what was going on in Jerusalem. So we need to ask an important question at this point. 
if God's people, his church in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, if they had fallen into idolatry, and they did, and if they were worshiping the sun, is it possible that Christianity would make the same mistake, that Christians would fall under the same deceptions? Let's continue our tour of the world and look at a few more uh, pictures of religious icons in the world. Here we see the Virgin Mary, and this is a, a large sculpture, but you can see that she is surrounded by a representation of the sun. Once again, there, is the, uh, the, there are the solar rays that go out from behind her. Those are straight, and we also see the more curvy lines of the, the circle or the oval that is behind her. So very clearly a representation here uh, within Catholicism of the sun god as well. On the right side of the screen, this is an orthodox representation of Mary and the baby Jesus, but once again, we see the round solar disk behind them. Here is another sculpture of Mary, and if you look closely, she is not holding a baby boy, but the Virgin Mary is actually holding a small representation of the sun. So the sun god is what she is holding. And Pope Benedict made it very clear in a statement in 2008 that uh, this is how the papacy views the Son God and Virgin Mary. Here's what he said. She appears clothed in sunlight, that is, clothed in God, observed the Pope. The Virgin Mary is in fact completely surrounded by the light of God and lives in God. And he concluded it this way. The Immaculate One reflects with all of her person the light of the Son, which is God. Very clear statement there from Pope Benedict XVI that uh, in his view and in their view apparently, the Virgin Mary is really a representation of the Sun God and they are uh, honoring and even worshiping the Sun God through their adoration of Mary. Now in 1990, a fascinating book was published titled The Keys of This Blood. It was written by Malachi Martin, a former Jesuit priest and he was writing about some inner workings of the Vatican and he had some very interesting statements in regards to what Pope John Paul II was expecting to happen sometime soon. Let's read that statement. Pope John Paul II is a pope who is waiting. He is waiting for an event that will fission human history, splitting the immediate past from the oncoming future. It will be an event on public view in the skies, in the oceans, and on the continental land masses of this planet. It will particularly involve our human sun, which every day lights up and shines upon the valleys, the mountains, and the plains of this earth for our eyes. Now let's stop for just a moment and make sure we understand what we just read. According to Malachi Martin, Pope John Paul II was waiting for some great event to happen involving the sun. And this event would literally slice human history in half. Uh, from what had happened before to everything that happens after this event. It would be, according to the statement, a global event, something that happens uh, around the world and is visible to every human eye. And at this point, we should be reminded of what the Bible says about the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 verse 7 says that every eye will see him. When Jesus comes back, it will be bright enough that every human being will see it, no matter where they are on earth. The return of Jesus will also divide or splice human history from everything that has happened before to everything that happens after. Let's keep reading this statement uh, regarding the expectation of Pope John Paul II. On the day of this event, it will not appear merely as the master star of our so-called solar system. Rather, it will be seen as the circumambient glory of the woman whom the apostle describes as clothed with the sun and giving birth to a child. Fissioning it will be as an event, for it will immediately nullify all the grand designs the nations are now forming and will introduce the grand design. Fascinating statement from Malachi Martin regarding what he believed Pope John Paul II was waiting for. Now let's turn to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about the second coming of Jesus Christ and what might happen just before it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, we read this regarding what happens just before the return of Jesus. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, Paul here is writing to Christian believers. So he is warning that there will come a falling away from true Christianity, from biblical Christianity, sometime before Jesus comes back. And then he goes on in verse 4. This power will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul is predicting here, the Bible is predicting, that before Jesus returns, a power will be revealed in this world that has actually fallen away from genuine Christianity, but yet remains connected with Christianity, and even passes itself off as being in charge of Christianity, because he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That word translated as temple in the Greek, the original language, is naos, N-A-O-S. And that word is used frequently by Paul to describe the church. So a power would arise from within the church that shows itself as God. And we have to ask the question, has this happened? Do we find a power that is connected with Christianity, that claims to be Christian, and yet is uh, setting itself up as a kingly power over the church. Psalm 99 verse 1 says, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. Here's a description of the throne of God. In heaven God sits on his throne and he is surrounded by angels or cherubim. In the book of Revelation it says that there are not only two cherubims beside his throne, but there are four living creatures as well. So we come back to our question, do we see or can we find in the world today a power that is connected with Christianity that claims to be in charge of Christianity and yet is claiming to be in the place of God himself? And the answer is yes. You can see this picture here of Pope Francis sitting on his throne. There are two golden cherubs on either side and there are four living creatures or priests surrounding him. Pope Leo XIII in 1894 wrote, We the Pope hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. This is not the only statement regarding the supposed divinity of the Pope. Here is another statement from the Catholic National, July 1895. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. And so what we are looking at is a system that has fallen away from Bible truth, yet remains connected with Christianity and even claims to sit as a kingly power over Christianity. And I want to be clear that there are many, many individual people within this system that will be saved and that will be part of the kingdom of God. But the system the Bible reveals has fallen away from truth and is no longer safe to follow. Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Okay, what is Jesus saying? He is saying that the, his kingdom, the kingdom of God, will not be built with human power. It will not be built with fighting. It will not be built with force. It will not be built through politics or through money. Jesus said, let the earthly kingdoms build their kingdoms that way. My kingdom is not from here. I will not build my kingdom that way. So we ask the question, okay, then how will Jesus build his kingdom? And in the very next verse, Jesus gives us the answer. John 18 verse 37 says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Don't miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus will build his kingdom not through force, not through politics, not through money, not through power, but through truth. As people read the truth, as they hear the truth, as they accept the truth, and as they seek to live the Bible truth, God will build his kingdom and make those people part of his kingdom. Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So the question is, this power that we are looking at in prophecy, what is its attitude 
to the Word of God. Jesus said that the Bible, or the Word of God, is truth, and it is this power, or this tool, that He will use to sanctify people or make them holy, make them part of His kingdom. So what is the attitude of this church-state power that we are looking at toward the Bible? And we'll let them answer. The Catholic Record on September 1, 1923 said, The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Deny the authority of the church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Very clear statement that the church regards itself above the authority of the Bible. And this fits exactly with the prophecy that we're looking at in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that it would fall away from genuine biblical Christianity. Now what does that prophecy say will happen next, after this power has been revealed in the world? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 says, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So the Bible does predict that Satan will reveal himself to humanity before Jesus comes back. Satan has been kept in chains of darkness. We saw that in Jude verse 6. But a time is coming where God will permit him to reveal himself to humanity as an angel of light. But he will be destroyed by a greater light, the true light. And that light is Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ comes back. Verse 10 goes on, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. We need to make sure that we don't miss what the Bible is saying. It is not enough to know truth or to be interested in truth. We need to love the truth. And how do we love the truth? We spend time with the truth. We spend time with the Bible. We read it. We study it. We pray that God will give us understanding and discernment to recognize its message for us today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so ultimately, truth is not a thing. It's not even a book. Ultimately, truth is a person. That person is Jesus Christ. How do you come to love a person? You spend time with them, don't you? And so we come to love the truth or Jesus Christ, by spending time with Him. It's just the same as a human relationship. We must come to the point where we love the truth, and knowing and loving the truth is more important to us than anything else in life. Now let's put this together. Let's combine some of the pieces that we have been looking at in this study. Number one, Satan will visibly appear before humanity just before Jesus Christ returns. Number two, this counterfeit second coming will occur in connection with a church-state power that uses politics rather than Bible truth to grow and expand. And number three, because sun worship is the universal form of idolatry, the deception will involve sun worship in some way. Now at this point, we're going to, to look at a recent document that was put out on October 4, 2023 by Pope Francis. This document was titled Laudate Deum, and it spoke about the climate crisis and what the Pope sees as the solution to that crisis. In paragraph 38 he said, The demands that rise up from below throughout the world where activists from very different countries help and support one another can end up pressuring the sources of power. It is to be hoped that this will happen with respect to the climate crisis. So the Pope is is hoping for, and he is asking for, and he is urging a grassroots worldwide movement of ordinary people that will begin pressuring their political leaders. He makes this clear in the next paragraph. For this reason, I reiterate that unless citizens control political power, national, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. So don't miss what the Pope is asking for. He is saying, here is how we solve the climate crisis. Here is how we move forward as humanity. We must get the people of the world to unite together to form an army and to put political pressure on their leaders, whether they're local leaders, regional leaders, or national leaders. 
And what will they be doing as they pressure those leaders? Well, they will be pressuring those political leaders to put into law the Pope's suggested solution to the climate crisis. And what is that? We don't have to guess because in Laudato Si, which was released in 2015, Pope Francis made it very clear what he believes the solution is to the climate crisis. And here's what he said, paragraph 237. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So the Pope's solution to the climate crisis and many other problems in this world is that Sunday become a civilly protect, protected day of worship. He is not the first Pope to make this plea. Pope John Paul II said, In the particular circumstances of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. So this is not a private agenda or a personal uh, agenda of Pope Francis. This is something that the Vatican and that the papacy has been um, aiming for and pushing for for a very long time. That is the legislation by nations around the world that will protect Sunday and make it a day of worship. Now, at this point, we need to look at a story in the Bible because history repeats itself. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 says, History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. So we need to look at biblical history to understand what is happening in our world today. As we look at this next story, we will see that the Bible reveals what will happen when ordinary citizens are influenced by their religious leaders to put political pressure on their leaders. That story is found in the final hours of Jesus Christ's life. As Jesus stood on trial in front of the Roman governor Pilate, we find this story in Matthew chapter 27. We begin reading in verse 15. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. Why did Pilate want to release a prisoner? Pilate recognized that Jesus was innocent. He realized that the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, had brought Jesus to him because they envied him and because they didn't like him. But he recognized that Jesus was not a dangerous criminal. And he wanted to release Jesus, but he didn't have the courage to do it for political reasons. And so he finally thought of an idea. He would bring another prisoner, a really bad guy out, and he would place them side by side, and then he would ask the people, who do you want me to release to you? Pilate assumed that the people would ask for Jesus to be released and for Barabbas to be executed. Verse 16 goes on. They had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Now, one commentary on the Bible tells us this about Barabbas. The Roman authorities at this time held a prisoner named Barabbas who was under sentence of death. This man had claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed authority to establish a different order of things to set the world right. Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He had gained a following among the people and had excited sedition against the Roman government. So Barabbas was a, a fascinating mix of rebel, of murderer, of liar. Uh, he had this spiritual or religious dimension to him because he was controlled by Satan himself. And he was also involved in politics. He had excited sedition against the Roman government. Now, if we look at the characteristics of Barabbas, we find some interesting things. Barabbas, according to the Bible, was guilty of murder and insurrection. He was also sentenced to death for his rebellion and violence. And finally, his name, bar Abba, or Barabbas, literally means son of the father. I don't know if his father wasn't a creative sort or not, but that's what his name means, son of the father. If we look at Satan, we find the exact same characteristics. Jesus said that Satan was a murderer from the beginning, just like Barabbas, Satan was a murderer. He has been guilty of every death that has ever taken place. Satan also will be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. 
And so Satan and his angels are under the sentence of death. Those are those chains of darkness that the book of Jude talks about that we looked at at the beginning of our study together. And finally, just like Barabbas, Satan claims to be a son of God. In the book of Job, when there is a meeting in heaven, we see that Satan included himself among the sons of God in heaven. So here's the point. Barabbas is a representative or a type of Satan. At the trial of Jesus, Pilate brought out Jesus, the representative of God, and he brought out Barabbas, the representative of Satan. And he asked the people, who do you want me to release to you? And the people end up choosing Barabbas. Let's keep reading. Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. This is incredibly important for our study. The people did not come to this uh, position on their own that they would ask for Barabbas to be released. They probably would have picked Jesus. But the religious leaders of the day influenced and pushed them and coerced them into asking for Barabbas. Then the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the two will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. So the people, the crowd, the multitude, they end up doing what the religious leader has pressured and pushed them to do, and they ask for Barabbas, the representative of Satan, to be released. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. You see, Pilate still knew, he still recognized that Jesus was innocent. But because of the political pressure coming on him from the people, but ultimately from the religious leaders, Pilate gave in and he did what the religious leaders had wanted all along. He condemned Jesus and he released Barabbas. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Friends, this story is a type or a lesson. It is actually a prophecy of what happens at the end of time just before Jesus comes back. The world will once again have a choice between Jesus and Satan. The world, the world will have a choice between truth and error, between truth and deception. And the world, just like it did in Jerusalem on that day 2,000 years ago, the world will choose deception and error and ultimately choose Satan rather than choose truth and choose Jesus Christ. And friends, the world is primed right now for a divine being to appear. Christians are looking for Christ's second return. Jews continue to wait for the Messiah's first advent. Many Muslims expect the Mahdi or the twelfth Imam to appear in their lifetime. If we look Elsewhere, we see that Hindus are awaiting Kalki, the final avatar of the god Vishnu. We see that Buddhists are looking for Maitreya to descend to earth and teach anew the Dharma, or the law. And the occultists and spiritualists are looking for the cosmic Christ, which we have already seen is the sun god. Now there's a fascinating statement written by a spiritualist. Her name was Alice Bailey. And she wrote this many, many years ago but it is pertinent for our time today. Here's what she re wrote regarding the appearing of these divine beings. Thus a great and new movement is proceeding and a tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place. This will go on until A.D. 2025. During the years intervening between now and then, very great changes will be seen taking place. And at the great general assembly of the hierarchy, held as usual every century. In 2025, the date in all probability will be set for the first stage of the externalization of the hierarchy. Now, this is not a Bible prophecy, and I am not saying that something will happen in 2025, but this is the expectation of many in the occult and spiritualism world that 2025 marks at least the beginning of the possible appearance of those beings that they worship and serve. Now the Bible says those are fallen angels and ultimately they are Lucifer himself. 
Something else could happen in 2025 involving political pressure to put into law what Pope Francis has wanted all along, which is the protection of Sunday. Project 2025 is a conservative movement, largely of evangelicals and Protestants in the United States. And they want to take back the United States uh, as they see it, for, uh, to swing it back into Christianity. And so they have written a mandate for leadership, 2025, that will go into effect, they hope, if a conservative president is, re -ele is elected next year in 2024. You can see here on their website, they say this book is an invitation for you, the reader, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith, and Ms. Smith, to come to Washington or support those who can. Our goal is to assemble an army of aligned, vetted, trained, and prepared conservatives to go to work on day one to deconstruct the administrative state. Now, many things that they are pushing for, you might agree with, and they might even be good, many of those things. But on page 589 of this large book, they say something very important. Part of this mandate for leadership is Sabbath protection. So they say Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest. And until very recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. And then they call for Congress to encourage communal rest. This is part of their vision for what this nation should do if they get control of it once again. Congress should encourage communal rest and that day would default to Sunday. Why would that day default to Sunday? Because almost all Christians worship or observe Sunday as the day of rest. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. God rested from his work of creation on the seventh day of the week. He has invited humanity ever since then to join him in that rest. In the fourth commandment, he said, this is the day to remember as the day of rest. It is a memorial of me as your creator. But we see another power at work in the world that has set up another day that has moved supposedly the sanctity of the Sabbath to Sunday and now is trying to push for people to put political pressure on their leaders for Sunday, the first day of the week, to be protected by civil legislation. Revelation 18 verse 2 says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. If you find yourself as part of any system whether it is political, whether it is religious, whatever it may be, but if you find yourself as part of a system that is fallen into this sun worship trap and that is not honoring God on the day that he has set aside, the seventh day of the week, but is leaning toward or observing the first day of the week, this verse is for you. God says that these systems have fallen, these religions have fallen, these churches have fallen. And eventually it will be these nations that will fall if they go along with this agenda. Verse 3 goes on, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So it's not just a church problem. Revelation reveals that at the end of time, the, the nations of this world, the political powers, will give their allegiance to the beast and they will unite with the papal uh, plan and agenda to protect Sunday as a day of worship. It's not just the political powers as well, it's also the merchants of the worth, the great corporations, the, the ones that control the money supply, the banks, they will all get on board this agenda at least for a short time. So what should you do if you find that you are part of this system. Here is God's call to you. Ver, uh, Revelation 18 verse 4. Revelation 18 verse 4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. 
Friend, God does not want you to suffer the plagues that will come on this system, Babylon, because it has turned its back on him, because it has rejected his law, because it has put deception in place of Bible truth. God wants you to be saved. He wants you in his kingdom, and so he is inviting you to come out of it. The question is, if you come out, where do you go? And the Bible tells us the answer to that. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So how do you come out of Babylon and become part of God's kingdom? It's very simple. Revelation 14, verse 12 tells us that first you must accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and you put your faith in Him as the only one that can save you. Secondly, you make the choice and the decision that whatever the Bible says, you will follow. You will keep the commandments of God. This includes the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As you make that decision, and as you claim Jesus as your Savior, God promises to give you strength and power and enable you to come out of these fallen systems of the world and to stand firmly in faith on Jesus Christ and in obedience to His Word. Will you make that decision today? All of these things that we have looked at in this video have been explained in a powerful book titled The Great Controversy. This book explains how the Bible's end time prophecies are being fulfilled today. Let me illustrate this with a couple of quotes from the book. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Here is another statement from the same book on page 592. And this statement speaks to the political pressure that will be uh, placed on political rulers to put into effect the Pope's agenda for Sunday sacredness. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth, and even in free America, Rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about Bible prophecy, if you'd like to understand more about end time events, I invite you to get a free copy of the book, The Great Controversy. This book, The Great Controversy, also explains how you can avoid being deceived. You need to get a copy of this book, and we want to send one to you. Click the link in the description or pause this video and use another device to follow the QR code, and we will send you a free copy of The Great Controversy while supplies last.